Hello, welcome to the Ponderings Podcast. This is your host, Milo. In this episode, I will be going over an article written by Karen Houle titled Animal, Vegetable, Mineral, Ethics as Extension or Becoming, The Case of Becoming Plant. This is a, a 2011 article, and um, this is a work of eco-philosophy in that it's a philosophy of plants. It's a vegetal philosophy. Um, she wants to investigate uh, phenomenologically how plants are, where, when, etc., rather than just focusing on the what of plants. So we're not just focusing on what plants are, but how they uh, maneuver, even though we don't perceive them to maneuver. It, like how they um, become, how they grow, and how that growth is kind of their movement, how they communicate, and what that could mean for us if we start to think how plants think or how plants um, engage with the environment around them. Uh, Eco-philosophy is an understudied area in philosophy, but has been getting a bit of traction with climate change. Um, I really enjoyed reading this paper, specifically because it helps me engage in a perspective that is non-human, uh, taking the human out of the center. Um, our historical view of non-humans, such as plants, animals, non-organic beings, has been mostly hierarchical in that humans have been considered as higher on the imagined evolutionary chain in terms of our intelligence, awareness, and ability to self-reflect. Karen Houle, in her article, she tries to dismantle this hierarchical thinking and also tries to show us through examples of botanical studies that plants in particular are more complex, alive, and intelligent than what we have previously considered them to be. Or she also wants to make sure that we try to embody or think with plants, that we are not using the information or this experience as a way to extract some sort of use or utility or value that is for human benefit only, or for benefit at all. The aim isn't to explain why plants are useful for us and why we should keep them alive, but rather the aim is to see plants as a different as a different other that has intrinsic value and that we have the potential to engage in a relationship with plants. So this kind of gets me thinking about anti-ontology. So first, ontology is uh, uh, the study or is a, a philosophical um, study of the nature of being, the isness of something, what things are versus what things are not, and why do we want to engage in an anti-ontological approach? So ontological or questions of being focus on knowing things based on what their ultimate function are and what their purpose is. Um, on page 89, uh, she says, what a thing is good for and whether it achieves the ends for which it was designed, intended, or is capable have become the chief modes and sources of value and meaningfulness. So we sort of want to take this utility or utilitarian approach out when we're looking at like non-humans, when we're looking at plants, when we're looking at uh, things that are different from us. And rather than seeing what, how can this be useful, how can this be beneficial for us, we want to try and just learn and see it for what it is, for the difference that it is. So she elaborates on a quote from Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus, quote, becoming animal is only one becoming among others, unquote. Um, she elaborates on this using the becoming plant because of the fact that it's been understudied in Deleuzean studies and also just um, in philosophy in general. Western philosophy has tried to think animalistically, becoming animal, but the human is still categorized as higher or more, or of more value than its animal counterparts. Animal and human are also still seen as incredibly different from each other. Animal philosophy, although would advocate for equal 
valuing of animals and respect for their intrinsic value usually ends up onto onto stabilizing that is resituating the human as still morally and essentially superior as first class and animals and other non-humans as second class Hull thus wants us to engage in thinking ecosophically and to avoid this onto stabilization as well as to avoid domesticating ecology in this process of thinking with plants so again we have to keep in mind as we uh try to think with plants by learning about them learning about how they communicate learning about just how they um engage with the world we want to try and not project our own human assumptions onto them and also to not place ourselves as still better than or of more use or of more benefit or something um we kind of just have to see that the universe in itself has so much diversity and there's space for all of this diversity we can't not have diversity like the i guess what i'm trying to say is that the just even on earth or, or honestly the whole entire universe is extremely diverse and this diversity is what constitutes it it's essential it's there isn't like a first principle there isn't like this first thing it's it's always been diverse it's always been extremely creative and complex so yeah so plant philosophy hull references richard carbon's studies in plant communication research so on page 94 she quotes plant behaviors are defined as rapid morphological or physiological responses to events relative to the lifetime of an individual since darwin biologists have been aware that plants behave but it has been an underappreciated phenomenon the best studied plant behaviors involve foraging for light nutrients and water by placing organs where they can most efficiently harvest these resources plants also adjust many reproductive and defensive traits in response to environmental heterogeneity to in space and time plant behaviors have been characterized as simpler than those of animals and recent findings challenge this notion by revealing high levels of sophistication previously thought to be within the sole domain of animal behavior unquote so again um we've always in the past looked at plants or compared plants to other non-humans that move around saying that plants are simpler the even though they have very complex behaviors that they're still simpler than animals but recent research again has shown us that this is not true they just have a very different way of being of becoming their existence is very different than the existence of animals and humans um animals and humans have a lot in common although we like to think that we don't of course there are differences between animals and humans and different species but i think we've always struggled to understand plants or why we've always struggled to see them as alive or having some part of or some sort of cognition or things like that is because of how incredibly different they are specifically because they don't have this centralized like nervous system or a centralized subjective unity going on like humans or animals do where all the organ systems and all of these things work in conjunction for a plant um there isn't an individual it's a an assemblage it's a multiplicity so um thinking with plants encourages us to think more in a pluralistic sense um seeing the multiplicity in things so yeah although these things are true that you know these plant behaviors of foraging for light nutrients water placing organs where they can most efficiently harvest um the recent findings of the complexity and intelligence in plant life who reminds us to avoid the philosophical trap of wanting to engage in classical philosophical terms so we want to 
avoid subjecting the plan to, quote, terms of resemblance, differences as degrees of similarity of function, relevant functions, and the relative value. These are all anchored by the human. Again, we want to avoid auto-stabilizing. We want to avoid always referencing back to the human. So instead of seeing like, oh, these are the ways that plants are similar to humans or and that's where their value is placed. So instead of placing the value of plants based on how relevant or how they resemble humans, um, we want to value plants just for their own difference, just valuing plants because they have intrinsic value, not because of how they resemble us or how similar they are to us. Same thing with animals. It's like, oh, the more intelligent um, an animal is, the more we should care about its life. That I think that thinking is problematic, um, specifically because it's, again, it's anchoring the human as a center, as the most valued, as seeing, it's, it's sort of seeing the human as a god, that whatever is in our likeness, then that is what will have value for us, which is not true. But anyways, but yeah, it's this need to give reasons to why plants or animals should be taken seriously. That's the issue. Animals and plants are often compared to humans, specifically in order to establish their utility or value based on how they resemble humans, rather than just acknowledging difference as inherently valuable, not just for the benefit of humans. So what does she mean by becoming plant? So... Again, we're taking this anti-ontological approach, anti-isness or whatness. We're not focusing on the isness of something. Hull wants us to orient towards the concepts of becoming and unbecoming. So on page 96, I'm going to quote, A becoming is not a description of an actual or ideal property or feature of an entity, so much as a description of an altered scalar intensification the taking on of certain relations of movement and rest, enabled as it enters a particular zone of proximity with another in a particular way, unquote. So for instance, an individual human is made up of societies. So again, um, taking this uh, multiplicity approach, a assemblage, um, we're trying to think of, think like plants, think assemblage not individual. But anyways, yeah, human is made up of societies, organs, cells, chemical exchanges, communications, systems, nervous, central, etc., which extend to relationships with other human individuals, societies, um, other plants, animals, uh, the situated environment of the human, the atmosphere, the atmosphere from which we relate to plants through exchange of chemicals such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, the concept of becoming encompasses the fact that we are not independent substances. We are processes which are constantly changing and are constantly in relationship with other societies, other assemblages. Becoming plant thus would be engaging in the perspective of assemblage. Plants, in contrast to humans and animals, do not have a centralized point of view, but rather exist as a multiplicity as an assemblage, moving or rather growing towards necessary relations in their environment. Also, plants move or grow as a response to their environment, whether they need to grow towards areas with more light or less light, away from predators or threatening relations. The way plants experience time is also incredibly slow compared to ours. And the bulk of their relations are felt at the chemical or micro level, since again, they do not have that centralizing subjective unity. This lack of unity allows them to lose any part of the plant without it negatively affecting the entirety of the plant. Their lack of identity also allows them to be able to stay in one place, adapting to any change in the environment, such as the coming and going of seasons. So... I'm going to quote on page 111, again, with this topic in mind of pluralism, multiplicity, assemblage. Uh, so, quote, thinking plant thoughts shoves us in a better way than thinking animal thoughts does. 
toward the truth that the correct unit of analysis is not the individual, nor the dyad, but the assemblage. The assemblage is not a unit in the sense of a stable physical entity with a particular form and having one or two particular components and one or two dominant functions. Rather, it is a description of the quality or state of a radical collectivity or what Deleuze and Guattari cheekily call unholy alliances. An assemblage is less a thing than a transitory verb with a particular consistency or a mobile state. And states are made up not only of people, but also of wood, field, gardens, animals, and commodities. Unquote. So here, Hull takes individual to mean that plants can not only be objects that are observed or studied, but also subjects that have their own chemical fingerprint, their own individuality, distingu distinguishing them from other plant assemblages. They cannot be categorized into a specific type or genus. Plants of the same species have differing chemical fingerprints. For instance, who quotes Durst and Pickett on their study on plant communication on page 100, quote, all plants release volatile chemicals and the chemical profile from different plants is different and can be specific to that plant. This observation complicates the basic assumption that in signaling, a plant is acting as a genetic type. So again, uh, plants, they're an assemblage, but these collective, these societies, so we can think of plants being a society, um, these societies have their own specific chemical fingerprint. So in a sense, they are subjects. They're subjects in a very very different way than humans and animals are but nevertheless they have their own individuality in a sense when t when you're referring to them as the collective that they are so like between like an animal plant or a tree their societies they don't have a you know centralized unit but as a whole they are this collective and they have their own chemical fingerprint even compared to uh, plants of the same species or something. But yeah, they all release volatile chemicals and the chemical profile from those, uh, from what they release are different in each plant. So these volatile chemicals are signals which emanate from plants when they are wounded, stressed, or basically have any interaction with their situated environment. Each interaction gives off a specific signal. For instance, if it is attacked by a particular insect, then one specific signal emanates. If another insect, then another signal, and so on and so forth. Um, on page 100, Hull mentions that, quote, this forces us to imagine not only that plants are individuals, but that these individuals are continuously co-evolving with and in varying environmental relations, which themselves are evolving in complex ways. Plants are not in any meaningful way beings in isolation from an externality which is configurable as secondary or alien, toward which they must move, and against which they need immunity. So-called generic types are real individuals, and those so-called individuals are, are always already in and with fluid non-additive relations with others, unquote. So here we can see these collective societies that are plants as thinking subjects. They are evolving, they are communicating, they are growing um, in relation with their environment. Another really interesting thing in reference to the complexity of plants is their tendency to have uh, to create alliances and these alliances are not direct either they're very indirect but they form anyways as they um as they relate to their environment uh specifically intraspecies communication so becoming plants would entail us taking the time to communicate or have a more equal relationship with o other organisms Hull mentions that, quote, plants manage simultaneous interactions with diverse organisms, 
such as insects, fungi, animals, birds, single-celled organisms, other plants, unquote. She lists some examples to show this intraspecies communication. For instance, a beetle larva that eats maize. When the maize plant is attacked by these beetles, the root systems of the maize plant emits a chemical which attracts a nematode, and this nematode eats the maize rootworm. So even though these communications are not direct, they occur uh, across different species. One will send one signal, the plant will respond, and their response will be um, received by other organisms in which the um, response wasn't clearly directed towards. So the plant isn't directing communications at specific things. They are responding continuously to what is happening in the environment. So another example is an aggressive grass that induces defense in barley. When the roots of the barley are stressed by the grass, the barley emits a chemical which reduces the number of aphids, and aphids are a small insect which are a threat to barley. Um, but yeah, so the communication indirectly combats the aggressive grass by emitting chemicals which reduce the other threats such as insects so although they might not be able to reduce the aggressive grass, the barley is able to send signals that reduce other threats, in that case, the, the small insects. And I'll quote Hool again on page 112. Quote, for one, plant becoming opens up thinking about relations as transient alliances rather than strategies, unquote. How can we live with plants and animals? in a way which they are not just utilized for our benefit, but rather a mutually beneficial alliance? How can we respond to our environment in a way that, in a way where we create transient alliances? So this requires us to kind of like look at our lifestyle and not just um, where we wanna be like green and eco-friendly or something. It's more like reducing our control on the environment, on spaces, um, letting plants grow, letting plants take up space, letting animals take up space. And because the plant here isn't this indirect communication, these alliances, there is a lack of controlling the other. The plant is just responding to its environment. And then for some insects or some organisms, these responses are beneficial and they can form alliances like bees can couple with flowers and things like that. And at the same time, they can both respond to the environment and reduce the threat of other organisms. But this alliance is not forced, which is something interesting to think about. How can we have a better relationship with the environment that also is not controlled? Because right now we sort of control all, most spa um, spaces, even landscapes. We control like where uh, things are planted, um, what's concrete, what's um, what space is available for other plants and animals. But also how can we avoid controlling becoming more green or something? These are interesting things to think about. So that gets me into the topic of dyad mutualism versus assemblage. So dyad mutualism refers to a partnered or coupled relationship between two different organisms, such as a bee and a flower. Studies on plant communication, which were mentioned previously, dismantle this binary pairing specifically because it shows us that there is more complex communication going on, not just between the plant and an insect, but rather there's communication going on simultaneously to different organisms in its situated environment. There isn't a clear dyadic communication going on between two organisms, or even there isn't a third that receives indirect benefits or relation, but rather who proposes that learning from plant communication, its variability and range, proves to be one that is more of an assemblage, a multiplicity, rather than a dichotomy between two phenomena. So there isn't a direct versus indirect, 
There isn't an origin versus outcome. There isn't an organic versus inorganic, no kin versus alien, as Hull puts it. But rather, it's a process relational becoming, an ongoing plural communication um, response and alliances form with the plant's situated environment. And of course, all of there's alliances as well as like things that you push away with your responses by like sending chemicals that reduce threats or whatever. But even that, there's still there's so much communication happening at the um, at the chemical level that is emitted and received by other organisms and other plant species, even if they weren't the direct um, re- uh, intended recipient or something. So on page 111, there's this uh, beautiful quote that I think really um, ties this all together, that, quote, whatever plants are up to, it is complex being together in the world, an original sociality going beyond any simple sense of between. So and what's beautiful about um, plant thinking or... Yeah, yeah, just uh, thinking about plants and how they respond and inter- interact with their environment and work in conjunction with their environment. What's beautiful about it is that it isn't trying to glaze over or erase difference. It isn't trying to say like, oh, we're like a all unified unity together or something. It's it's embracing difference. It's embracing diversity and complexity and the fact that you can send a message and to someone, you know, some thing, some being, and this message that you're emitting will always um, be received by the environment or other people indirectly. Um, you can't isolate yourself. Even in a coupling, there isn't an isolation. So who reminds us that we don't have knowledge of the entire spectrum of plant communication, specifically the communication that occurs underground. Um, Most studies focus on above-ground volatiles, so above-ground chemicals, but plants communicate through a plethora of media, not just air or the above-ground. One of these underground communication networks is called a mycorrhizal network. This mycorrhizal network, or CMN, is an underground network composed of mycorrhizal fungi which connect individual plants together and transfer water, carbon, nitrogen, and other nutrients and minerals. So the plants not only have their own root system, which communicates with the ground, but other organisms such as fungi in the mycorrhizal network form beneficial alliances with other plants and organisms. So plants also communicate with organisms in the rhizosphere. So so other than the a mycorrhizal network uh, of fungi that work in alliance with the plants. Um, plants also communicate with organisms in the rhizosphere, which is the narrow region of soil near the roots, which is directly influenced by root secretions and its neighbors, which in this case are soil microorganisms. So plant communication does not entail what we usually think of communication through the senses such as eyes, ears, and taste. Plants are able to communicate in other ways, primarily and especially through their heightened sense of touch, specifically because of the fact that they live in two different spheres, above ground and underground. So although plants can't move like we do, where we're able to like, you know, plants usually stay in one place and they grow their roots under the ground and then reach out into the atmosphere, into the above ground. So although they're not moving in our sense of the word, they are moving, they're growing, and they're engaging and responding with their environment in a very intelligent way. It's just very different um, than how we engage with the environment. So I've probably just been throwing a lot of information at you and hopefully you've been able to see the value in it or how it's how valuable it is um i really am into this 
uh, vegetal philosophy or plant philosophy and the kind of thinking that it promotes. So yeah, just to wrap it up, thinking about the fact that, again, their communication is indirect. Although they respond to one thing, um, it sort of bleeds out into the rest of the environment or the rest of its situated environment. And there isn't evidence to show that how plants respond directly benefit them. So again, for plants, they are just responding. They are communicating and engaging. There isn't a goal or a purpose to their response or a direct goal. There's many like indirect uh, things that occur in that communication. So there is a lack of evidence confirming that improved fitness is the point of communication. So Hul finishes off her paper talking about what we can learn from this lack of evidence or lack of confirmation of our common assumptions, uh, what we project onto the other, in this case plants, from our own human experience. Um, through this negative philosophy or negative approach, observing what isn't there to, sh to show us what is um, by eliminating all these resemblances or similarities or or want for similar similarities or resemblances to human. Rather, we can just see the plant for the differences that they are. But yeah, we can start to look at the plant for what it expresses, the differences, the, the complexity that is so different and alien to us. Um, but yeah, becoming plant for Hul has to do with what the plant expresses, which is its becoming, the plant existing as a verb. Um, plant thinking leads to a better way of thinking, specifically away from analyzing the individual, away from analyzing dualities, the dyad, um, and more towards the assemblage. We, uh, we as humans have a unified subjective experience with our centralized nervous systems and organ systems that work in conjunction for the whole, but this whole is ultimately an assemblage like plants. We are composed of multiplicities, cells, organs, systems, culture, history, context, situated environment. Also, if you think about it, we are composed of non-human organisms. And without these non-human organisms, we wouldn't be able to be. Like these, all these cells, the microorganisms, the stomach bacteria, just our composition depends on these societies that exist within us. Um, our... Uh, our aliveness depend on the societies in the human. But yeah, I really enjoyed reading her paper, and I'll have the link in the the episode notes. If on if you're on YouTube, it'll be down below. But yeah, I I really recommend taking a look at this paper, or just taking a look at some plant philosophy or eco philosophy. It's really interesting, and it's nice to kind of step away from humans and look at other life on Earth and how they engage and respond uh, to their immediate environment. And, well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'll probably be making some more plant philosophy episodes in the, f in the future for sure. Um, but yeah. Thanks for listening, and I hope you stay tuned.